Right, so we've been doing a little bit of stuff on bioplastics. Now, we think of plastics as being one thing, but because plastics aren't really material, plasticity is actually a property of materials. What we're looking at, really, when we're looking at these plastics is polymers. Now, a polymer is just a long chain of one thing repeated again and again and again. That one thing is called a monomer, and obviously lots of them is a polymer. When we get polymers, then we think immediately of plastics, and that's just a, a way we have of looking at the world. Those plastics we're familiar with, acrylic and ABS and polystyrene, polyethylene, that sort of stuff. They're all examples of polymers. Now, they're so ubiquitous in our life, we've kind of got polymers linked to plastics, and we always think of them in the same way. But there are lots and lots of polymers. One whole set of polymers is what we've been looking at when we've been looking at the bioplastics. They're, in fact, just polymers. If you think about your muscles, there are lots of amino acids all linked up into something called a polypeptide. So proteins are just polymers. When you think about things like sugar, we link all of that together, you get cellulose, another polymer. So polymers predominate lots and lots of structures. Now it's no surprise that things like starch and um, casein form plastics. It's because they are already polymers. Now we eat those, obviously, they're a food material, so we are essentially eating polymers. But then we're made up of proteins and sugars, so we ourselves are polymers. So polymers are just this hugely interesting, fascinating, amazing, diverse section of the world in which we live. Now a polymer is anything that is made up of repeating units. So we think about, like say, proteins, they're just amino acids. Cellulose, well, that's just sugar. And the polymers we know, polyethylene, is just ethylene in a long link. But there's a whole other class of polymers which are equally as fascinating, and they are the geopolymers. These are the kind of things that form and are very similar to rocks. I mean, I'm sort of giggling at that, because how do you describe these? But they are just like stone. There are some arguments, and I don't want to start a debate here, but there are some arguments that the pyramids in Giza are built out of stone polymers, geopolymers. Now, geopolymers came to um, prominence a while ago because of cement. Cement is obviously one of those horrendous things that chucks out a ton of CO2, and for carbon dioxide emission, they're looking at replacing cement with geopolymers. Now, the most popular geopolymer is a polymerization reaction between silicon and aluminium, and they're the aluminosilicates. So if you get something containing aluminium, and you react it with something containing silicon, you will in fact get polymer formation of an aluminosilicate that is in fact what most rock and clay is made of. Now, this is true of anything that contains those two materials. Now, I am a huge fan of this material, Sodium metasilicate. Dissolve this in water, you probably know it as water glass. It's an amazing material that has just a thousand uses. I've got a couple of buckets of it because I use it all the time. Um, it's used for things like binding glass frit. If you want to 3D print glass, then this is the stuff you could use to do some 3D glass printing if you want. It's used to make fireproof paints, so ceramic paints are made out of this stuff. Very often you find this in glazes, in ceramic glazes, that sort of stuff. It's also in your washing powder, incidentally. A lot of washing powder contains quite a lot of sodium silicate in it. So you find it absolutely everywhere. Now it is alkaline, so you do have to treat it with care. Don't go dipping your hands in there and eating your sandwiches. Wear gloves if you're going to handle it a lot. If you're handling it a little bit, your hands are going to feel soapy. And you're going to think that's because of the soap and washing powder. It isn't. It's because it's an alkali and it is attacking the fats in your hands. So if you can use it over a considerable amount of time, wear gloves. You'll notice I'm leaning on the bar on the jar because really it's not going to kill you if you open the lid. It's not horrendously dangerous. Just treat it with enough respect. Now you can make up various strengths of solutions. The most popular strength of solution that you can buy actually as a ready-made solution is 40%. So this has 40% by weight, sodium silicate and water. And clearly I just made that up earlier for the video. And I want to demonstrate to you what happens when we add an aluminium into this silicate. So here we've got sodium silicate and oxygen, which is the water glass. And here we've got some aluminium sulphur in solution. And I'm going to give you a close-up of what happens when we drop the um, aluminium sulphate into the sodium silicate solution. So that's my solution of sodium silicate, and I'm going to pipette some 
uh, aluminium sulfate into the sodium silicate. Can you see that? Almost immediately it forms this fine needle-like structure. That is an aluminosilicate. I love it actually, it's like magic. Okay, that's kind of a cool reaction where we get that because it's quick and it does something. But you might be asking yourself, okay, that's awesome, but what do you do with that? Well, if you make quite a lot of that and you dry it, what you get is this stuff. This is fire blanket, it's the same that's in here. So you could use this to make your own lightweight fire bricks. It's certainly the stuff that's used to make this, which is um, ceramic fire blanket. So it has a lot of uses. Now, anything, remember, containing aluminium will do this. So if we're using things like blast furnace slag, for instance, that's got aluminium in it. Fly ash, which is the residual from coal burning, it's got aluminium in it. Red mud, which is the stuff that's uh, the waste product of aluminium smelting, that of course has got aluminium in it. And this is why it's so interesting to people. Because it can take all this industrial waste, mix it with a bit of sodium silicate, and suddenly you get a polymer that's really useful for things like replacing cement. Now, this is clay from my hillside. Now, I did a video on making this stuff. I actually just went up to um, the hill where I lived, dug some of this out, and then went through the process of how to turn it into ordinary clay. And there's a video on that that you can watch if you want to recover your own clay. Most clays, actually, including things like bentonite and zeolite, they're aluminosilicates themselves already. They're just very loose particles of it. So we've got a lot of aluminium in here just waiting to be used. Now, if we take some of that, which we're going to do, and we mix it with some sodium silicate, it'll be quite loose. So we need to put a filler in there as well. And there's a whole lot of choices of filler. We could use fume silica. I'm going to use... This stuff, which is magnesium oxide. I got this from an equestrian centre. I have no idea why they use magnesium oxide, but I got, a, I think, a five kilo bag for like 10 pounds because they do something with horses with it. Now, that is brilliant because there'll be a slight reaction with that as well, and it will form a magnesium silicate. Now, magnesium silicate is essentially talc. That's what talcum powder is. So we can effectively mix talcum powder but that reaction will help with the formation of the aluminosilicate polymer. So we take some of our clay, some of our magnesium oxide, and mix it up with some of our sodium silicate. And that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so I've mixed it up into a paste, which is pretty much the same consistency as the paste we took it from. And rather disappointingly, it hasn't done anything, which is, you know, a bit disappointing, as I say. However, there is a really useful thing you can do with this because that reaction between the uh, aluminosilicate clay, the magnesium oxide and the sodium silicate doesn't happen particularly quickly at room temperature. It will happen over about two or three years, it'll happen, but at room temperature it takes forever, so it stays nice and soft for ages. That's not something that's detrimental, that's something that's really useful because one thing that will happen to it is if you heat it to 200 degrees centigrade, around about just less than 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it will actually go rock hard. It sets at that temperature, which is the same temperature as your ordinary household oven. So, <laughs> you've got to think, haven't you? You'll notice that this lump of clay that I actually put in at 200 degrees centigrade, well, it's as hard as a rock, and it's a lot more waterproof. If, if you chuck that in water, eventually it will dissolve, incidentally, but it is waterproof at this stage, and it is rock hard. It is not flaky like a fired clay would, uh, like an unfired clay that has been dried would be. Had this only dried, it would uh, break into a powder at the least squeeze. This has set like a rock. And it's set like a rock because of that reaction that we talked about, which is kind of cool. But then equally, you've got to think, well, what do you do with it? Well, let's say you want to be a potter, but you don't have a kiln. You could use that mix to make your own decorative pottery. Sculptures, statues, that kind of thing. Vases, so you put dried flowers in, all that sort of stuff. is going to be really approachable to you without a kiln you fancy giving that a go, then you can make up that mix and become a potter in your own home without the expense of having a kiln. Another thing you could do, obviously, is just make up the mix and sell it. You could sell it for that reason. 
there's quite a few of those home fired clays that clay that fire in the oven, but they tend to be um, plastic polymer based. Here we're making a home fired clay that can be fired in your ordinary domestic oven that is geopolymer based. Now, to be honest, I think that's an awesome idea. I can see that as a product that people could sell and make some business out of. Even if you want to give it a go yourself, I can see you having success with that kind of thing. So I think that's a really awesome thing. So like I say, polymers themselves aren't restricted to just the way we think of them. That is the plastics that your, your kitchen bowl is made of. Polymers are just this huge range of stuff running right from that, right the way through to yourselves, the rest of the world, the trees, the grasses, and geopolymers as well. So I wanted to share those ideas with you, particularly on this home-baked clay, actually, because the home-baked clay, I think, is really, really useful. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching.